The election countdown begins. The Prime Minister indicates his preferred timeline. My working assumption is we'll have a general election in the second half of this year. The Labour leader is already setting out his pitch to voters and says it should be sooner. If he can't name them for days, then effectively he's just squatting in Downing Street. Also tonight, evacuations underway in Nottinghamshire as storms swell rivers to record levels. As ITV's dramatisation of the post office scandal ends, what next for the real victims? We have a special report. I have to wake up every day taking 15, 16 tablets. I want night. I can't sleep. No escape for Prince Andrew from assault allegations with the release of the Jeffrey Epstein court files and... Return of the King, the hologram Elvis shaking up live music. This is the On TV Evening News with Romney Weeks. Good evening. The Prime Minister today effectively fired the starting gun on the next general election, saying his working assumption is that it will be in the second half of this year. And both Rishi Sunak and Labour leader Sikir Starmer wasted no time in making their pitches to voters as they visited key battleground areas. The Prime Minister hinted at tax cuts to come and attack Labour's green proposals. And in an interview with ITV News, Keir Starmer accused Mr Sunak of dithering and delaying, but stopped short of promising lower taxes should Labour win. Here's our deputy political editor, Anushka Astana, on the long campaign ahead. In December, Rishi Sunak was accused of being a bit touchy. But there was no sign of that today. The Prime Minister with a spring in his step. So, will he be giving us a general election in 2024? Yes. <laughs> so, no, my, my working assumption is we'll have a general election in the second half of this year. And in the meantime, I've got lots that I want to get on with. Hang on. What was that? I said, look, my working assumption is that we'll have a, an election in the second half of this year. Because in the meantime, I've got lots that I want to get on with. And that means cutting people's taxes this Saturday. That's a tax cut worth £450 for an average person in work. We can do that because we've halved inflation. And with that, the Prime Minister overshadowed Keir Starmer's big day, appearing to rule out an early spring election that the Labour leader clearly wants. Four years I've been working for this. It's been a long, hard slog. And I won't lie, I've hated the futility of opposition. What about televised election debates? Just bring it on. Keir Starmer, you say bring it on. How would you feel if the election is not in the first half of this year? If the Prime Minister is now hinting that it's going to be later in the year, then I think the question is, what's he hiding? Well, this is a serious issue for the country. If he can't name the date, then effectively he's just squatting in Downing Street, holding the country back with his dithering and delaying. But I can tell you this, we're ready. But Keir Starmer was not ready to commit to certain tax cuts, including unfreezing income tax thresholds. Your shadow chancellor described that policy as pickpocketing voters. So in your words, not mine, why would you not commit to stop stealing from voters? We have said that um, the first thing we need to do is start economic growth in this country to make sure we've got more money coming in. But any tax issue has to be fair and affordable, and they have smashed the economy. But in fairness, you say this is stealing from voters. But they have smashed the economy. There's no getting around the fact that they've smashed the economy. Liz Trust took a sledgehammer to our economy, and people are paying the price. Keir Starmer chose to give his speech in a Conservative seat near Bristol that he wants to win at the next election. But if that doesn't happen until autumn... He'll be in Westminster a little longer than he hoped. 
And you just go, why is the Prime Minister almost ruled out an early election? Well, I think because there's been so much chatter here in Westminster about the idea of an early election, partly because of what the government have done. They've brought forward a tax cut to this Saturday instead of April. They've announced an early date for the budget. All of that led to a lot of pressure on the Tories, including from Labour, to announce a May election. And Tory strategists I spoke to just think this was too much. They're too far ahead in the polls. They think Rishi Sunak needs more time. But as you say, he almost said it wrongly, but he didn't quite. So Labour still think it could be May. Anushka, thank you. A major incident has been declared in Nottinghamshire after heavy rain caused the River Trent to flood. The council says residents in the most at-risk areas should be prepared to evacuate their homes with river levels predicted to hit a record high. And there are fears there could be flooding in the south of England tonight with more torrential rain. Ian Woods has the latest. It's not just a deluge from Storm Henk this week which has caused scenes like this. Heavy rain throughout the autumn has left the ground saturated. These football pitches are fit only for water polo. Nottinghamshire County Council declared a major incident. Its headquarters overlooks the River Trent, which is likely to burst its banks. There are people who are, need to be on alert down the River Trent in particular. Uh, because uh, the levels are still rising and uh, I know that our district councils are already evacuating some people uh, in uh, anticipation or as a precaution, hopefully. It wasn't just a precaution which forced residents here out. Homes alongside the river are already flooded. Summer must seem a long way away for them. Get the fire brigade, we have to evacuate some people. Some people don't want to leave. Some people had to leave because we've got a lot of disabled people elderly people in the park and we sort of managed to sort of get them out and sorted so why wouldn't you leave because i've got a cat that you can just see there behind me and two chickens and we didn't want to leave them behind they said they would put them in the rspca but we've got two elderly chickens and we knew that they said we couldn't, we couldn't do them any good the met office has issued a yellow rain warning for much of the south of england with up to 50 millimeters predicted to fall in the space of nine hours if you do get a flood warning, please follow that and the action taken. So have a grab pack ready with any medicines and insurance documents ready to leave the house. Know how to turn off your gas and electric. And if you are in immediate danger, please call 999. Agriculture has been particularly badly affected. In Somerset, with fields underwater, there's nowhere for the dairy herd to graze. I don't think I can remember a winter quite as wet or where it's gone on for as long as this. We've had an unprecedented amount of rain. And feeding the animals isn't the only concern. The milk they produce may have to be discarded if tankers can't deliver it because roads are impassable. We've been warned that there'll be a flood again tomorrow. So at the moment, there's, there's no end to it. There's a warning of major disruption to road and to rail services until the downpours finally subside. In Woods, ITV News. And let's get the latest now on the disruption the weather is causing. We have correspondents in Goring-on-Thames, in Radcliffe-on-Trent, and at Paddington Station in central London. First to Amy Lewis with some news breaking this evening in Oxfordshire. Amy, police there have referred themselves to their watchdog after a woman died during the storm on Tuesday. What more can you tell us? Well, the weather on Tuesday was pretty treacherous, just like it is today. And during the storm, a tree fell here. Now, uh, we are about 10 or so miles away from Reading and Oxfordshire, but the, we are in a very small village called Craze Pond. Now, when that tree fell, it was reported to police, but it was 90 so or minutes later that an 87-year-old woman was passing through here and uh, in her car, and she hit the tree and sadly died at the scene. Now, because of that 90-minute gap between the tree being reported and her hitting the tree, uh, the Thames Valley Police have now reported themselves to the police watchdog, the IOPC. The uh, Thames Valley Police are appealing for anybody who saw what happened to come forward, whether or not they saw the driver, the 87-year-old woman leading up to the accident, or they have dash cam footage. And as the IOPC, they say uh, that their referral states that officers reported that the tree had caused power lines reportedly to come down. Now, the 87-year-old uh, woman has not been named... Uh, but her specialist trained officers are working with her next of kin. Amy, thank you.
And to our Midlands correspondent, Ben Chapman on Radcliffe on Trent. Ben, the situation there is likely to get worse in the coming hours? Yes, I mean, this caravan park is very much the front line, particularly those ha homes you can see behind me. You can see how much the water has already come up over the course of this afternoon. What you can't see in the darkness is that the extremely swollen River Trent is running immediately behind those homes. They were evacuated this morning, and it appears that they are now partially underwater. It was this afternoon that authorities here in Nottinghamshire declared that major incident. What they were really worried about was all the swollen tributary rivers flowing into the Trent uh, would swell it potentially to its record level set back in the year 2000. Now, to the relief of everybody here, it would appear that that hasn't happened, although the river is extremely high. We think it has now peaked and is now dropping but the advice for people here uh, overnight and into tomorrow if they live anywhere near the river trent is to remain extremely vigilant and to be prepared for more flooding ben in nottinghamshire thank you and finally to graham stossard at paddington station and graham what sort of an impact is this having on travel well real problems on the train network particularly to the southwest the south here at Paddington, where Great Western Railway operates on, uh, out of view. You might be able to walk behind me. The departure board showing pretty much empty now. Earlier on, they warned people against starting their journeys this afternoon. They said if you had done so, perhaps it was best to try and get home as soon as possible. They said their direct route between Swindon and Bristol Parkway had to be stopped because of flooding there. While we've been here, there have been trains from Swansea and Exeter cancelled, and it's been getting busier. And busier. They said there were sites in Wiltshire, Somerset, Devon and Cornwall which were also in danger of becoming waterlogged, potentially stopping trains from going through there. It's not just here, it's over at Waterloo with South Western Railway as well. They warned commuters that to the south of Guildford and west of Basingstoke there would be severe disruption, especially between 1 and 7 today, but they warned that that might carry on into the evening as well. Graham, thank you. Prince Andrew is facing further controversy over his links to the millionaire paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. The Duke of York is mentioned more than 70 times in transcripts contained in unsealed court documents which have just been released. The Duke has always denied the allegations and Buckingham Palace says they are categorically untrue. Former US President Bill Clinton, scientist Stephen Hawking and Michael Jackson were also mentioned in the court documents but not accused of any wrongdoing. Our U.S. correspondent Dan Rivers has more. Jeffrey Epstein's crimes as a sexual predator are well documented, but mystery has long shrouded who else may have associated with him on his island in the Caribbean or at his other homes in the U.S. Today, new clues were offered in a series of court documents released by a judge in New York naming 170 people linked to the disgraced financier. Most prominent among them is Prince Andrew, who's named 70 times in the documents. The files come from a 2015 defamation case brought by Virginia Dufre against Epstein's girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell, which was settled out of court. Dufre had alleged she was abused by Prince Andrew as part of Epstein's sex trafficking ring. But despite this photo, Prince Andrew denied ever having met her or being involved in sexual abuse. Do you remember her? In Dufresne's deposition, she claims another alleged victim, named as Jane Doe III, was forced to have sexual relations with this prince when she was a minor in three separate geographical locations, in London, in Ghislaine Maxwell's apartment, in New York, and on Epstein's private island in the US Virgin Islands, in an orgy with numerous other underage girls. The testimony goes on to say, Epstein instructed Jane Doe III that she was to give the prince whatever he demanded, and required Jane Doe III to report back to him on the details of the sexual abuse. Prince Andrew strenuously denies all the allegations. I think the most ironic part of this whole saga is it's all about men abusing women, and there's only one person who's incarcerated, and it's a woman, Ghislaine Maxwell. And obviously after that, they then went after 
Vicky Ward tried to break the Epstein story, but she claims Vanity Fair took out the sexual abuse allegations concerning Epstein and Maxwell. She is unquestionably the woman who is most central to the scheme as it's, as it's depicted. But there are so many other people involved, men and women, who seem to have just sort of gone off and disappeared into the shadow. Among the other men named in the documents but who aren't accused of wrongdoing are the late physicist Stephen Hawking, former US presidents Bill Clinton and Donald Trump, former Vice President Al Gore, and pop star Michael Jackson. This new trove of information puts the Epstein case back under the spotlight, but it fails to answer key questions about the true scope of his abuse and who else was involved. Dan Rivers, ITV News in the United States. Junior doctors have become embroiled in a row with hospital bosses who have pleaded with them to leave the picket lines and return to work. Critical incidents have been declared by the NHS in Nottinghamshire and at a hospital in Portsmouth, while others have said they are under extreme pressure on the second day of the doctors' walkout over pay. The Prime Minister also called on them to end the strike. But the British Medical Association wants an improved pay offer and has rejected calls to end the industrial action. Chloe Keedy is outside Lewisham Hospital tonight. Chloe, why won't the BMA budge on this? Well, Lewisham's one of 20 hospitals that has submitted a request for junior doctors to come back to work. It's had that request rejected by the British Medical Association. How it works is there's an agreed system for what they call derogations, which is where junior doctors have to come back to work because of concerns over patient safety. And in order for that to happen, NHS trusts are expected to be able to show that they've exhausted all other options. But the BMA has accused some trusts, and we don't know uh, which ones, of failing to provide evidence that they've done that. And it's even gone as far as to say that it's received some requests uh, that it's described as blatantly false. In this round, um, we've received uh, you know, much larger numbers of requests. It doesn't really matter what's driving that change, only that we don't end up in a, uh, you know, a boy cries wolf situation where we have so many inaccurate or incomplete requests that we are unable to respond appropriately. Well, NHS England has defended the process, saying that when you consider that these strikes are taking place at the most difficult time of year for the NHS, it's hardly surprising that some uh, NHS bosses will feel they have to ask for extra support in order to keep patients safe. And it is patients, once again, that are caught in the middle uh, of all of this. People have been asked not to come here to A&E today unless it's a life or death situation. Despite that, some patients I've spoken to here have said they do support these strikes, although one man told me he thought that patients were starting to get sick uh, of being stuck in the middle of it, of it all. Right, Chloe, thank you. There's plenty more to come on the ITV Evening News, including... Paula Pendles has got the CBE. Shocking. Services to the post office. As the ITV drama looking into the post office scandal concludes tonight, we'll have a special report on those who were most severely impacted. What next for 16-year-old dance sensation Luke Littler and... Why Britney won't be making music again. We'll have all of that and more after the break. has warned that two million people in Gaza are on the brink of famine as fighting hinders efforts to get in desperately needed aid. UK Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron today said he's pushing Israel to get more help in to those who need it. It came as more Palestinian children were reportedly killed in Israeli airstrikes in the southern cities of Rafah and Khan Yunus. Today, the funeral of Hamas deputy leader Salah al arouri was held in Beirut as fears rise of conflict spreading across the region. John Ray has the latest. They are fighting on the beaches of Gaza, fighting for survival. 
Just the rumour of food draws a desperate crowd. Hemmed in by Israeli airstrikes and the sea, it's a battle within a war. And most days, it feels like they're losing hope. We haven't been given anything, says this woman. I'm waiting to feed my children. They have nothing to eat. The blessing of childbirth has become a curse for Ayman. In the smoky corridors of the school where she shelters, 40 to a room, and not even fresh air for her three newborn babies to breathe. We don't have enough oxygen to breathe. If I open the window, the smoke just comes in. We dream of getting back to our homes before the war. The United Nations warns that two million people are at imminent risk of famine, a man-made disaster. Some fear forgotten in an escalating regional crisis. That saw Israel exchange fire with Hezbollah fighters on the Lebanese border to the north. Israel says it killed four militants. In the Lebanese capital, vast crowds gathered for the funeral of the Hamas leader Salah al arouri an ally whose assassination by Israel, Hezbollah vows will not go unpunished. The situation is volatile. Israel says it will defend every front in a war that claimed 125 more lives in Gaza over the past day. Though Assad does not appear in those figures, he is a casualty nonetheless of hunger and disease and scarce medicine. Maybe it is better that he does not have to live in this suffering, his grandmother tells us. She says they all pray for peace, but that seems a dim prospect. Now all this as America's top diplomat, Anthony Blinken, is due back in the region with a single overriding priority, according to the U.S., and that is to get humanitarian aid urgently into Gaza to avert complete catastrophe. But he has, of course, a second familiar mission, and that is to try to stop this war spreading, something that he believes it is in no one's interest to do, but he, everybody here fears it may yet escalate. John, thank you. Retail giant Next has warned attacks on container ships in the Red Sea will delay deliveries and hurt sales if they continue. For weeks now, the Houthi militants in Yemen have been firing rockets into the busy shipping lane targeting vessels they consider to be linked with Israel. This affects the Bab al-Mandab Strait, a stretch of water just 16 miles wide, which vessels must pass through if they're to use the Suez Canal. Some shipping companies are now diverting around the southern tip of Africa, with Next, the latest company, to warn of delays. Our business editor, Joel Hills, joins me now from central London. So, Joel, what has Next said about this? Well, Next is celebrating a very happy Christmas, thank you very much, and it's pretty upbeat about the company's prospects in 2024, but it does list in its uh, trading statement difficulties with access to the Suez Canal as one of the risks the business faces in the year ahead. The disruption caused by the attacks on the shipping vessels in the Red Sea has yet to have a meaningful impact in truth on the choice, the availability and the price of goods in the United Kingdom. But next is warning that its best-selling lines will start to run short if the situation persists for several months. As it stands, the clothing that next sells is sold in the, on the whole or is bought and sourced from Asia in countries like China, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Now at the moment it's being diverted around the Cape of Good Hope as you've described. Next is looking at air freight as an alternative but note this the company is pledging not to raise its prices at all during 24 whatever happens in the Red Sea. Uh, it is they're saying that the outlook is pretty benign and that uh, uh, the most benign we've seen for a number of years, it says, because in the UK, pay has started to rise faster than inflation. Next shares jumped on this morning's trading statement up by over 5% at the close of play. By contrast, 
JD Sport had a Christmas shocker. The company's share price plunged by a staggering 23% today after it issued a profits warning. And it's worth noting that the insolvency practitioner Bigby's trainer estimates that 4,500 retailers up and down the UK are in what it describes as extreme financial distress. They will be hoping that next cheerful assessment of our economic prospects comes to pass. Joel, thanks for that. Teen dart sensation Luke Littler has been reflecting on his remarkable run, which ended with him losing a gripping World Championship final last night. Watched by millions of TV viewers, the 16-year-old took the lead in the Alexandra Palace match, but couldn't hold on against pre-tournament favourite Luke Humphreys. It was Littler's debut appearance, and his fairy tale isn't over yet. He's now been selected for the Premier League Darts Tour. Here's Andrew Misra. Finally, he was defeated. But Luke Littler's won the hearts of the nation. During the match, the 16-year-old threw everything at it. There was a head for a while. Ultimately, though, the world number one, Luke Humphreys, was just too good. It was a bit good standing there on the hill, watching Luke win his lift trophy, but he deserved it. He was the better man on the night. But I'm happy with a runner-up. I was happy with winning one game, as everyone knows, but getting to the final was just a bigger bonus. Coming from behind to lift his first world title, Humphreys knew he was spoiling the party. I think in, in the fans' mind, he's probably their champion. Uh, and that's fair enough, you know, obviously. He's, he's, he's a champion in my eyes, you know, I think he's an incredible kid. Uh, I have no problems talking about him because, you know, he was part of a, a great world final. He really was. It wasn't just me that went out there and played well. He was a fantastic as well. At the darts club in St. Helens, where Luke trained, even littler players hope to follow their hero's remarkable trajectory. I want to do what he's done, um, maybe even younger. Because uh, he plays, uh, I can tell all my friends when I'm older than that. Uh, Luke Littler, possibly a world champion, went to my darts academy. He just inspires me. If, he's, if he can do it, I can do it. That's, that, that's what I think. If you look at Luke and he's only 16, that could be them in two years' time. It, it just shows that anybody can do it. You must have seen much more interesting people coming to play here. Social media's gone crazy, our internet's gone crazy, our messages have gone crazy. Our kids want to join, we've had so many messages, I think we're going to have to set up a, a waiting list because we've got so many people who want to come and join, which is brilliant. So what's the advice for these eager youngsters from the man of the moment? Just keep at it, if you love the game, um, just keep at it, keep going, make friends and just Stick, stick to the board. Luke's success has seen him fast-tracked into Premier League darts. He is a young man who looks destined to be on the centre stage for decades to come. Andrew Mesra, ITV News, St. Helens. You're watching the ITV Evening News. It's 7 o'clock. Here's what's still ahead before Emmerdale. Terror in Liverpool after a gunman opened fire outside a cinema last night. We'll have the latest. Bad news for Britney fans as she shuts down any hope of a musical comeback. But get ready to fall in love with Elvis all over again thanks to AI. And I'm on the River Ouse in York, where there's a flood warning in place tonight. And over 200 flood warnings on rivers across the country, with more rainfall expected this evening. I'll have all the weather details later on in the programme. First, a special report on what's next for the hundreds of sub-postmasters and mistresses who were wrongly accused of stealing in the Horizon IT scandal. The miscarriage of justice based on faulty IT evidence is the subject of the hit ITV drama, Mr. Bates vs. the Post Office. That miniseries will conclude tonight, but the pain and trauma continues for the many victims. Many are still waiting for the compensation promised to them, and the stress has caused many to have health problems. Nick Wallace, who's covered the scandal extensively and was a consultant on the TV series, heard about the terrible long-term effects on two of the wrongly accused. 
two lives destroyed by the post office in different ways. Now their stories are being seen by millions of people. How do you now plead? Not guilty. I'm Jess Cole from Warsaw. I had a post office in Aldridge, which is the West Midlands. My ordeal started in 2009. Jess was prosecuted by the post office for theft using faulty IT evidence from its Horizon system. I thought I was doing the right thing, Jazz. The prosecution was thrown out by the court, but not before Jess had a complete mental breakdown. I tried to commit suicide. Whilst she was in hospital, Jess attempted suicide again. The doctors decided to apply electroconvulsive therapy to Jess's brain. It worked, but at a cost. Jess says she can't remember anything of her childhood. Even till today, I'm still on a lot of medication. I might not look as if I'm ill to a lot of people, but I'm suffering very badly with PTSD. Health is is everything, but to me, I have to wake up every day taking 15, 16 tablets and at night. I can't sleep. I've, I've never talked about it to anybody. Right, I've been through these a hundred times. I don't know, I haven't seen it before, look. My name is Lee Castleton. I was the postmaster of Marine Drive Post Office in Bridlington. I was accused of losing £25,000. The post office went after Lee at the High Court. He lost and was ordered to pay £300,000 in costs. He was bankrupted. We just kind of lost everything, but the impacts for the family um, were huge. Because we were um, ostracised in the, in the place where we lived. And um, it was just very difficult. Despite the government-owned post office accepting it was responsible for prosecuting innocent people, there have been complaints that the multiple compensation schemes are too slow and too complex. The Prime Minister was challenged on it today. My job is to make sure that we're putting in place the compensation schemes and all those people who are awfully treated, suffered an appalling miscarriage of justice, get the justice that they deserve. Lee wants politicians and post office executives implicated in the scandal to come clean about what they know. The people have lost their lives waiting for justice to be done deserve accountability. And I think it's about time that people really stood up and, and shook it and made it really happen. Paula Venels ran the post office for seven years. She also features in the ITV drama. The Post Office Limited does not accept any of the allegations that are being made. She declined our request for an interview. Well, this is Paula Vennell's house. We've tried to contact her, but she says she doesn't want to speak to us. Whilst this may come as a disappointment to the postmasters, it's unlikely to be a surprise, given her consistent refusal to be interviewed about the post office scandal. Paula Vennell's has repeatedly said in statements that she is truly sorry for the suffering caused to innocent sub postmasters. She's expected to give evidence over several days later this year at the public inquiry, a process she says she fully supports and is cooperating with. Jess and Lee just want some kind of closure. People don't realise that this isn't all over, you know. People are still having to fight every corner. If I walk past the post office, I feel sick. This was my life. This was going to be for my children. My children's future. And they've taken that away from me. Both accept this scandal will live with them and their families for decades to come. Um, yeah, this drama's pushed these cases firmly into the spotlight, but it all started a long time ago, didn't it? And you've been covering it for more than a decade. What's going to happen now? Well, accountability, as you heard in the piece, is front and central in the postmaster's minds. We've got the public inquiry, which is ongoing, and a Metropolitan Police criminal investigation, which is now in its fourth year. They are liaising closely with the uh, public inquiry to see if there could be a case to build against individuals within the post office or within government who conspired to pervert the course of justice. Because something went very wrong in this scandal. Lots of people got falsely prosecuted, and then the post office tried to cover it up. And that's what's unraveling at this inquiry. How long this will all take 
isn't quite clear. We're expecting the evidence to finish by the end of this year. It may report early next year, and then we could start to see uh, criminal prosecutions being laid by the Crown Prosecution Service. It could take many years before anyone sees the inside of a court, though. It's going to go on and on. Thank you. Now let's get an update on what's making the news tonight. The Prime Minister has indicated there won't be a general election this spring. Rishi Sunak said his working assumption is that it will be in the second half of this year. Prince Andrew is facing further controversy over his links to the millionaire paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. The Duke of York is mentioned more than 70 times in transcripts contained in unsealed court documents which have just been released. The Duke denies the allegations. A major incident has been declared along the River Trent in Nottinghamshire due to widespread flooding caused by Storm Ken. Well, it's not just the UK that's experiencing extreme weather. Flooding has hit much of Western Europe and Scandinavia is seeing temperatures as low as minus 44 Celsius. In Denmark, thousands have been affected by power cuts whilst motorists have been stuck for hours on snow-affected roads. Neil Connolly the latest. Stuck in the snow going nowhere as extreme cold hit Sweden. More than a thousand vehicles were trapped in one queue for more than 24 hours before drivers could be evacuated. For a nation geared to the worst winter can do, it's been a challenging time. Temperatures in one town in the north of the country recorded their coldest night for 25 years dropping to a bone-chilling minus 44 degrees Celsius. This is probably the worst thing I've ever experienced, this woman says. I've been stuck for 21 hours and I've got diabetes and need to eat regularly. I've been waiting here for 13 hours, this driver says. I hope they can get to me soon. Denmark has suffered its heaviest snowfall for more than a decade. Locked roads have left drivers stranded. I'm so bored here, Me and my eight-year-old son have been here for hours, this driver says. We've got no food or drinks. Back in Sweden, efforts to get roads cleared continue. But forecasters say the severe weather is set to carry on for some time. A cold air mass from the Arctic is responsible and shows little sign of giving up its icy grip. Neil Connery, ITV News. A man has been arrested by Merseyside police after a cinema was forced into lockdown last night after reports of gunshots. The shots were fired at three locations across Liverpool. The first was fired at around 8pm. Sanger News agents police were called at 8.30pm. Around 20 minutes later, shots were fired outside the Showcase Cinema in Croxteth. Then at 10.20pm, police were called to further reports of gunshots at a property on Malpas Road. Our North of England reporter Amy Welch is at the cinema in Liverpool. Amy, this incident caught widespread alarm last night. That's right, this must have been a terrifying ordeal. The cinema here only reopened its doors around 30 minutes ago after a gunman opened fire at three separate locations within a three-mile radius in the Croxteth and Norris Green areas of Liverpool last night. The incident here at the cinema happened while parents and their children were inside enjoying a film. And imagine this being the scene that met you as you tried to leave. They were kept locked inside the cinema for around 45 minutes as armed police tried to secure the area. Well, the government first opened fire at around 8 o'clock last night as the news agents around a mile from here, CCTV shows him wearing flip-flops, entering that news agents, pointing a gun towards the counter, demanding cash, then firing shots and then leaving the front door empty. Handed. He then made his way to the cinema at around 8.50 where we understand he threatened two members of staff in the foyer area of the cinema. He then left in a car and made his way to a residential area where it's understood that further shots were fired. Now that was at around 20 past 10 last night and some six hours passed before police arrested a man in the Pazakali area of Liverpool at 4.46 this morning. Forensics have been there all day and we understand that he was aggressive and had to be tasered during his arrest. Now police are currently questioning him on suspicion of the possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life and on suspicion of robbery. Merseyside police are keen to stress tonight that incidents like this are extremely rare, that it is not 
believed to be terror related and that nobody was injured. Amy in Liverpool, thank you. Police investigating the murder of Harry Pittman have released images of two people they'd like to speak to. The 16-year-old was attacked in North London on New Year's Eve, just minutes before midnight. Police have said the incident appears not to be gang-related. A 15-year-old boy has been arrested on suspicion of murder. And a Newcastle United fan has been banned from football matches for three years after admitting to making offensive comments about the Munich air disaster. 23 people died when a plane carrying the Manchester United team crashed in 1958. James Blake was seen making the comments in an online video during a game against Manchester City. Britney Spears has vowed never to return to the music industry. The singer, who sold more than 150 million albums and is one of the best-selling artists of all time, made her announcement on social media. She said rumours of her making a new album are trash, as our entertainment reporter Rishi Dabda explains. Give me more of exactly what adoring fans hope they'd get from Britney. New music, a world tour maybe. But the singer, who shot to stardom at 16, has poured cold water on the idea of a new Britney era. After rumours in the US media that she was planning a return to the studio and even tapping up collaborators, Britney posted, Just so we're clear, most of the news is trash. I keep saying I'm turning to random people to do a new album. I will never return to the music industry. When I write, I write for fun, or I write for other people. In 2021, her controversial conservatorship, which gave her father control over her life, came to an end after 13 years. And last year, she published a memoir telling her side of the Free Britney movement. A former Britney biographer understands why she called it quits. Music was absolutely everything to her. It was her life. And being in the conservatorship just really like deadened and killed that passion and love for her. And the music business symbolized not having freedom and not having any control. So I'm not surprised at all. Britney's last live performance was in 2018. Her most recent and possibly final release, a collab with Elton John in 2022. So for now, fans will just have to keep the classics on repeat. Baby, can't you see? I'm Rishi Davda, ITV News. Still plenty to come on the program, including... <laughs> Elvis is making his comeback thanks to the help of AI. And with more rain coming this evening, the next few hours will be critical for already flooded parts of England. I'll have a full forecast in a few minutes. Join me and Joe after the break. this evening. Joe, we heard earlier in the programme about the flooding in Nottinghamshire and elsewhere. How bad is it looking for the next few days? Well, unfortunately, we know there's more rainfall coming tonight, which will be a problem for the affected areas, particularly Nottinghamshire, for a time this evening. I'm this evening in York, where the river ooze and foss converge, and the rivers here are running incredibly high, like they are across much of the country. We have a warning in place here this evening, and there are over 200 warnings in place across the country as we go into this evening and overnight. The banks have burst in places, and buildings have flooded. And as you saw earlier in the programme, some widespread flooding in Nottinghamshire over the last couple of days. And if you take a look at these totals, just the first three days of January, Nottinghamshire has recorded 60% of its average monthly rainfall already, with Leicestershire at 58% and the East Riding of Yorkshire at 55% and more rainfall expected this evening for central and southern parts of the country. Now, the current Met Office warning shows the areas where that rain is likely to fall through this evening and into the early hours of Friday morning. 
And we're certainly not out of the woods yet in terms of flooding, but the threat is decreasing as we head into this weekend. As we can see here, the low pressure systems which are pushing across the country today and through tomorrow move away to the north and the east, and that will allow high pressure to build in from the southwest. So by the time we get to Sunday, most of the UK will be largely dry, and into next week it is looking a good deal better. Here are all the details for the next 24 hours. It's a cold and wet outlook, with some heavy downpours throughout the day. Hines Big Sue sponsors ITV National Weather. Some rather potent rainfall across the central and southern parts of the country this evening and over the next few hours really keeping an eye on those problem areas and to start the day tomorrow rain for the east of the country showers in places and thereafter our weather begins to settle down and certainly as we head into saturday and sunday it's quieting down and of course over the next few days we have a colder plunge of air moving in as well as we can see on this jet stream images over the next couple of days or so we're pulling in colder air across the whole of the country and it will be settling down nicely as we head through to Sunday and next week. Back down to around average or below, which means a return to overnight frosts and some mist and fog by night into next week as well. Now this evening's details, we can see that band of rather heavy rain moving its way northwards and eastwards for a time this evening and overnight. Elsewhere, quite showery conditions. It's not a particularly cold night, but will be quite blustery, particularly for western coasts as we head into tomorrow morning. On to tomorrow's details, a wet start for the east of England and parts of Scotland again. The best of any brightness will tend to be for western areas during the day tomorrow, and indeed over the next couple of days. There'll be a few blustery showers for western coasts and strong winds in the west during the day tomorrow. And temperatures are just beginning to feel slightly chillier as we head through the day tomorrow, and certainly into Saturday, you'll notice it's feeling colder. There'll be a few showers in Scotland on Saturday, but elsewhere, it's drying out nicely. Heinz Big Sue sponsors ITV National Weather. If you live in the affected areas this evening with that rainfall warning, do take care if you have to travel. There's likely to be lots of surface water and spray on the roads and further flooding in places, so do take care. Joe, thank you. And finally tonight, Elvis, as you've never seen him before. The king is being brought back to the stage, thanks in part to artificial intelligence. He'll be chained in an immersive concert experience, which will debut in the UK. Here's Katie Fenton. We know him as the king of rock and roll, a pioneer who inspired some of the biggest names in music, but now it's his turn to follow in the footsteps of others. Elvis Presley, the latest star to be brought back to life by AI. Those before him include Tupac, Whitney Houston, and most recently, ABBA, whose digital avatar show attracted more than a million fans in its first year. But can artificial intelligence really capture the king? I think you'll get a real sense of the king through all aspects of the show. So absolutely the AI aspect is really important to that and the performance. You'll also get to understand more about him though as a person by, by stepping in his shoes, seeing what his life was like. Since his death in 1977, the world's fascination with Elvis has lived on. Black hair. Most recently, his controversial relationship with ex-wife Priscilla captured in a film released earlier this week. And since last autumn, UK fans have been getting a glimpse of Graceland in a London exhibition of more than 400 artefacts. This is Elvis's iconic belt from 1969. Okay, how much would something like this be worth? That is worth half a million pounds. It's been really popular, so much so that uh, we were only supposed to open until February, but we are now extending through until the spring, so as many people, uh, not just from London, from, from all over the country, can come and see uh, all Elvis's um, prized possessions. Tickets for the AI show in London go on sale later this year, with more global dates to follow. And while fans might not get moments like this, they'll no doubt be saying thank you very much for bringing Elvis back in the building. Katie Benton, ITV News. And that's all for now. Julie's here at 10, but from me and all the evening.